to see that we have participants from all over the world joining us today. Um, thank you for joining us. And on behalf of Contact North, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar, Lessons from COVID-19 Pandemic, How to Improve How We Teach and Learn Online. My name is Sarah Govro. I'm a research associate at Contact North, and I'll be moderating the session today. So just a few items before we start. Um, as I mentioned, the chat is open. Just remember to select the panelists and attendees on the pull down menu so that everybody can see your comments. But if you do have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A tool. You will find that at the bottom of the screen. It says Q&A and there's little, two little word bubbles. And uh, we will be answering questions all throughout the session. And once the webinar has finished, I will post the link and the recording um, and slides to teachonline.ca and I will put that link in the chat momentarily. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Stephen Downs, Contact Nord, Contact Nord Research Associate. Welcome Stephen and thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm hoping you're hearing me. I hear you loud and clear. Awesome. And uh, welcome to everyone from my office here in beautiful suburban Castleman, Ontario, Canada, where it's a little below zero today, but pretty nice weather outside. So uh, I'm assuming you'd like me to just launch in, is that right? Yep, the floor is yours, Stephen. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. And uh, today I'll be talking about, uh, well, it's called Lessons from the Pandemic. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my PowerPoint. It's being annoying and not letting me see it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, And uh, so, lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, how to improve how we teach and learn online. And um, as you know, uh, everybody has uh, been learning lessons from the, uh, from the COVID pandemic. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is all still new technology for me. And uh, I don't I have I have no idea why it's showing that version. Well, I'll do it like that. Then it's going to be like that with me. I'm using um, Open Broadcasting System to present this, and I'm trying to do a few new things with this. And of course, um, the new things have their own way of doing things their own way right at the time I'm giving the presentation. But such is life. Um, sadly, uh, Sarah, we've lost our beautiful TV style presenting because although it was working perfectly a second ago, now it comes out like that. And um, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, um, presentation is basically organized into three parts. Uh, the first part is uh, about the 10 lessons that we can learn from online learning. The second part is, um, and that's not a real group of people, that's a fake group of people. The second part is uh, three challenges that we've discovered that we have in online learning. And the third part is three improvements that we can make. I'm not normally a fan of doing listicle type presentations, but um, it's what I was asked to do. And yeah, I'm actually kind of comfortable with it for this particular purpose, because there is no single narrative that we can draw of the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic as a whole. Uh, 
there's a, a wide range of experiences people have had in different parts of the world and, and different kinds of learning that they're doing. So I think it's better in this case to, to pick and choose specific points that we've learned, specific issues that have come up, specific things we can do to make things better without trying for the grand sweeping narrative. Um, now, I've been, well, in addition to doing my own online teaching, which hasn't always gone well, I've been doing a number of sessions, uh, weekly online sessions. I've had some disasters. Uh, I'm also doing my usual newsletter and monitoring what everybody else is doing and getting into conversations and sometimes arguments with them. Um, and uh, I've been keeping up with a document of my own of all the different lessons learned that different people have been coming up with. Doesn't make me the one and only authority in this subject. I think uh, if, you know, what we've seen over the last year is a lot of people became fluent in uh, what it takes to learn, uh, what it takes to deliver learning online. They became fluent in that in a hurry. So uh, that's the structure for the, for the webinar. Now, before I get into the actual content, I want to say, uh, put in your, your questions and your comments. Um, you know, use the chat or, or whatever is available to you there. Um, Sarah is monitoring that. I can't see it, but Sarah is monitoring that. And she will interrupt me with your comments or questions. And I've asked her to do that. So this is the exciting part of this presentation. You never know when. But at any moment in this presentation, I could be interrupted with, by Sarah with a comment or a question. And my resolution is to answer or address, uh, address that comment or question. So that's the plan. That's what we're up to. And so away we go with the slide presentation. So we're going to begin with the key takeaways from this uh, webinar. And again, I'm not really a learning objectives person. And if you get something different from this, that's fine. I'm happy with that as well. But the key takeaways, thinking about the nature of teaching and, and learning online, and especially keeping in mind, uh, you know, the, uh, the way we, you know, what we've learned about teaching and learning from teaching and learning online during the, the pandemic. Um, the second takeaway is uh, authentic assessment. There's been a lot of discussions about ass assessment. We'll talk a bit about that. And third, and something I think we've really learned during this pandemic is uh, how to address and how to talk about the diverse needs of learners. Hey, Stephen, we've opened up a can of worms here. We have some questions for you already. Already, let her rip. <laughs> All right, the first one's from Lisa. She'd like to know what subjects you teach. Okay, uh, what I've been teaching, like normally when I teach, I teach philosophical subjects, but that was a long time ago. Uh, more recently, I've been teaching about online learning through courses, massive open online courses and such. Uh, during the pandemic, I, uh, in the fall, I was teaching about uh, personal learning and personal learning environments based on my work in that area. And then since the uh, Christmas break, I've been doing a series uh, on different learning technologies. And in fact, I just finished a session right before this session uh, doing uh, something on uh, cloud collaboration. That was a lot of fun. Excellent. Thank you. Next up is Angela. What are your thoughts with all the COVID online research being published? Is it misrepresenting what quality online learning is? Is it feeding into the pessimist? 
<laughs> uh, yes and yes, but no and no. I mean, and and this is we'll 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 look at this, uh, but I'll I'll come to this in a slide or two. But what's happened in in COVID is that a lot of people who weren't doing online started doing it for the first time, and it's hard to do something for the first time, especially right in the middle of an emergency situation. And so they went from an environment where they were really comfortable doing what they were doing to an environment where they weren't comfortable doing what they were doing. And that's reflected in what we've seen in the coverage over the last year. Everything's harder. Everything takes longer. Stuff doesn't work, you know? And this is all stuff that those of us who've been teaching online for a long time went through, well, first of all, over a much longer period of time. Um, secondly, with new technologies as they were introduced. So we didn't have to learn it all at once. Um, and, and third, we, you know, uh, we became familiar with it over time. So from the perspective of people who've been doing this for a while, what we've seen is the, the early efforts by people weren't as good as they could be because they didn't know what they were doing necessarily um, and reflected the lack of experience that they have. But my perspective is I completely understand that. I expect that. And you know I'm not surprised that a lot of people responded that way um, but I think that over the longer term, we'll settle into an understanding of what good quality online learning looks like. And uh, at the same time, uh, we'll see a much greater increase in the ability of people to actually produce and deliver that. Any more? Yes, so uh, I just wanted to uh, um, just ask our participants if you would mind putting your questions in the Q&A tool. It just helps me organize them. I don't want to lose track. Um, I just find in the chat if there's side discussions going on. I don't want to lose anyone's questions. And I have um, used a, a setting where you should be able to see everyone's questions that are asked um, in the Q&A. So you should be able to have access to that. Um, so Angela would like to know if the courses that you teach, Stephen, are they open? Everything I teach is open. Uh, I've got uh, a long hit, you know, uh, on my website, there are, I don't know, something like 500 presentations that I've given that are all open. All the courses that I've taught are open. Um, you can see a lot of that stuff in my video channel. Uh, haven't recorded everything, but I've recorded most of what I've taught. Um, I don't like teaching behind a paywall. Uh, as I like to say, democracy dies behind a paywall. All right, that's it for now. All right, so we're moving into the lessons then. Um, and the first lesson is the lesson that I was just talking about. And that's that, uh, you know, we, we can't even now directly compare the new thing with the old thing. Uh, the old thing is traditional teaching. People have been doing that for a long time. They're comfortable with it, no problem, right? The new thing is online teaching. And it's going to take time to, to you know, uh, it's going to take time to understand the technology and even more to the point, understand the best methods of working with that technology. And, and I'll tell you, you know, in, on both sides of that, in person and online, it's something you can spend a lifetime learning. I mean, look at me, I've been around for a while. I've been teaching both ways for a long time. It's, I could still be learning things, new things. I'm sure people are watching this presentation today and saying, ah, 
he could be doing this, he could be doing that. And you know what, you'd be absolutely right. I could be doing all of those things. I could be getting this tech better than, than I'm doing right now. And so we, we have to allow for that. And that's, that's the first lesson, right? Um, we have to allow for that and we have to give ourselves some time, you know, even after the pandemic, to become more familiar with a lot of this stuff. And, you know, uh, people say, well, it's not a generational thing. Well, it, it kind of is a generational thing, but more it's a, uh, you know, we've had experience using this tech kind of thing. And, uh, you know, as you use the tech, you become more comfortable with it. As you become more comfortable with it, then it becomes easier and easier to adapt to that change. But change is hard. That's one of the key lessons that we've learned. Another lesson. Um, learning is social. Yeah, I know. We knew that already. Uh, you know, there, there's, you know, but what, one of the things that we've learned perhaps specifically during the pandemic, not just simply that learning is social, it doesn't mean that you can't learn on your own, etc. But I think the even more important underlying lesson is that some learning outcomes are social. We don't just learn as individuals in a society, even if we're learning socially in a society. We learn socially as a society. And we've seen that during the pandemic where we needed social learning in order to produce social outcomes. And we really needed social outcomes during the pandemic. Uh, you know, people used to say, uh, we're all in the same boat. Um, and it wasn't quite true. The, a more accurate depiction would be, we're all in the same flood. We have different boats. But we needed to learn, all of us, how to adapt to this new situation, being in a flood, alone or together. And we had to learn things about masks and social distancing or physical distancing, what's, ex what's expected, what's not expected, etc. And we needed to learn not just that, but how to keep on learning and keep on functioning as a society, holding, for example, our conferences online like this. Um, in order to produce these social results, you know, and something like, let, let's take the capacity to do online learning. That's a kind of social learning, right? It doesn't work if only one or two people can do online learning. It's the sort of learning that we all need to be able to do together in order to make it work. So it's not a one-off kind of thing. I think that's a really important lesson. Uh, you know, I, I think that the pandemic has shown us that individualistic person, I don't want to say person centric, but, you know, focusing solely on the person approaches to learning, uh, or for that matter, pretty much anything in our society uh, is going to be in some important ways dysfunctional. All right. So what else third yeah, lesson. i'm going to interrupt oh. you there because you're talking about the importance of uh of social aspects i yep. had a a question emailed to me prior to the, uh your session that was uh, directed and yep. i'll read it out for you um joanna asked how do we respond to the question of students with their cameras off for the entire lesson <laughs> i strongly suspect that when they are not visible for the entire session that they are not present either they're not fully attentive or they've walked away but i also recognize the very real issue of zoom fatigue mm -hmm. so i teach social work so being present is a professional skill i'm trying to demonstrate and teach so facial cues an authentic interaction are as important to teach as the material in the textbook. I am struggling to find a balance and I'm interested in your suggestions or ideas. So there's, unfortunately, there's no simple answer to that question. 
because there's so many different factors that are going to come into play here, right? One factor right off the bat, and we, we, we hear it in the question, is we don't know what they're doing on the other end. Um, and there is an analogy to the in-class experience, and that is we don't know what's going on inside a student's head. Um, or for that matter, under the desk, although we can maybe suspect what they're doing there, they're reading a book, texting, whatever. Um, but there is that element of uncertainty. And there's a second aspect to that, and this was a key lesson, I think, learned in the early days of not just online learning, but being online generally is, we can't control what they're doing. And, uh, you know, that's really different from the typical class. You know, if somebody wasn't paying attention, they're looking out the window or whatever, uh, you know, we could walk up to them and say, pay attention. And they had to pay attention because, you know, you have some actual authority in the classroom to make them do that. You can't do that online. And so that's where it becomes really difficult. And that's where the answer becomes really complex. What are they doing? Why aren't they paying attention? Um, and there are many factors that could be explaining this. And, and they're probably different for each person. For example, uh, they might not be paying attention because their house is on fire. <laughs> you know, they might not be paying attention because they already know this stuff. So it really doesn't matter if they're not paying attention. Um, or maybe they are paying attention but they're lost or confused or, you know what I mean? There's, there's all kinds of explanations. It may be because the kind of presentation is not as good as it could be. For example, you could be doing what I'm doing now and just talking, talking, talking and not getting any feedback. And, and that kind of presentation uh, doesn't lend itself to active listening. So my thinking is, Trying to force them to turn on their camera is trying to reassert some kind of authority the way you were able to do it in the classroom. Ultimately, though, I think it'll be unsuccessful. And, and people will learn, have learned, how to sit there and just nod along and sit there. I've, I've done this in meetings, right? And at the same time, right, you know, even now, as I'm talking to you, and it looks like I'm really participating in that, I actually have my email open in front of me. I, I see I've got email from Dropbox here and so on, and you can't tell. And people have learned how to do that. Uh, and if you don't believe me, there it is. <laughs> so, um, the, the, the only suggestion I can make is and, and we'll, we'll touch on some of these in this presentation. Um, make it interactive. Make it engaging. Uh, find other ways than just seeing their, their face on a video screen to determine for yourself that they're active and engaged. So the two parts. you know, Make it engaging and then find other ways to determine whether they're engaged. But again... You, you can't force it. There's no way to force it. It's That's one of the key differences between working online and working offline. Um, there is no real authority online. Well, we have some discussion in the chat <laughs> about this even. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll briefly mention them and we'll see what your thoughts are. So Angela points out that I think this is one of the myths of face-to-face -face class, that physical presence means cognitive presence. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, cameras on does not mean engagement, and cameras off does not mean disengagement if you have designed an effective learning experience, like you just mentioned. Yep. Um, and then Emma goes on to say that uh, we have found that using tools like Mentimeter, or other feedback tools is often an easier way to get feedback from the students more so than video. Yep. And and that's something I do a lot. And I mean, even try to do with this session and, and definitely do with my other sessions is I always like to make sure there's a back channel. 
and and it's kind of interesting i actually brought the concept of the back channel to the physical world in my presentations where i've done that quite a bit where i encourage people to chat on Twitter or in the chat or whatever and I follow that while I'm giving the presentation. Uh, that can lead to a bit of a disjointed experience too and uh, again it's one of these things that really has to be learned in order to make effective. But having that back channel and especially having a back channel where you can see the contributions of each individual person that's why people like voting or, or you know uh, polls or things like that. Uh, that's a really effective way of keeping track of what's going on, getting the feel for the room, if you will. Um, although I, I noticed during the pandemic that phrase, read the room, became popular uh, almost overnight. More? We're good to go. Thank you for letting me interrupt you there. No problem. Do it again anytime. So, in addition to learning being social, the other side of that is teaching is social. Teaching is not a solitary profession. Now I know, because I've spent a lot of time in a classroom in front of a bunch of students, it sure feels like a solitary profession sometimes. And especially if you carry that practice over to the online world, uh, you know, it, it feels like you know, you're, you're the only one in the room. You're working all by yourself. Uh, you know, you're not getting any help, any support, etc. And what we've learned, well, I mean, first of all, we knew that teaching wasn't a solitary profession already. You know, teacher teaches in a school. They need a building, they need facilities, support staff, someone to clean the, the room, someone to organize uh, all the people so that they actually show up to class. They need lights, computer networks, etc. even in person, right? Online, now they're working with advanced technology, both digital and in-person environments. They're working with the new tech computers and all of that. They need to be constantly developing their skills and they need a team supporting them. Now, it might be a good idea to think of online presenting the way we think of presenting the news. And that's kind of why I wanted to go with my, uh, my news presenter mode because I thought my news presenter mode would be a pretty good way of illustrating that. But instead, I ended up illustrating why teachers need a team of support because it's too easy to mess stuff like this up, especially when you're also trying to give, uh, you know, deliver the content, answer questions. Um, you know, if, if you look at my setup here, see, I'm trying to work with a couple of TV screens, my, my microphone, my phone, all of that, my, my computer, and I'm trying, so I've got right now two computers on the go, one camera, which is one too few, um, a phone just in case, uh, which should be recording my audio, but I forgot to turn it on again. Uh, you know, teachers need a team. Um, anyone who's presenting online needs a team. You can do it on your own but it's not as good and and you know if you're doing it in an environment where the results really really matter then you need that support that's why i'm so happy to have the support here so i don't have to try to follow all of those questions uh or or comments that are coming in i can just be interrupted at any time which also adds to the fun of it um and, and that takes something off my plate and it makes it easier. And that's going to be the case teaching online. Oops, come on, you can do it. There we go. So now we move on to the next lesson. Ah, oh, there's my presenter view. <laughs> uh, and the next point is we need live events. 
Now, doesn't mean that everything needs to be live. Um, but you know, back in the early days of online learning, we used to think, oh, we'll just create a whole bunch of canned lessons and that'll be great. And people can just, you know, watch some online video, uh, do some previously prepared questions, maybe read some content, and that'll be great. And I think we learned pretty quickly that doesn't work. Not by itself. You know, you look at all the courses that Athabasca University has taught online over the years, they always made sure there were live segments to them. The MOOCs that we offered, myself and George and others, that we offered in the uh, 10 years following 2008, we made sure we had live events every week. And we see that even more so now during the pandemic, where you can't just cancel a conference and release a bunch of papers. People don't like that because they, they don't get as much out of that. The live interaction is, is really what draws us in. Um, you know, it's something that we look forward to, something that we anticipate, something that keeps us interacting, something that promotes uh, what Anderson, Garrison, and uh, Archer called presence. And the presence is, this is the way I interpret it, knowing that there's a person at the other end of the wire. All of you watching this presentation today know that at the end of this, I'm trying to move this out of my way so I can see what I'm doing. At the end of this, you know, you know at the other end of this presentation, there is a real live person. And that means you don't know what might happen anything could happen who knows um and you know that that adds to the engagement a bit uh it, it adds to the excitement a bit why well, I, I might do something really strange like that or that or go just go back to the slide or whatever you don't know maybe sarah will jump in with a question you don't know um and, you know, and this applies as well to things like sports. You know, we, during the pandemic, we didn't just re watch reruns of old games. Uh, they tried really hard to get sports up again. Um, you know, even going to the movie, even though the movie was recorded, the audience was live and people missed that. So we need live events. Um, learning is better with live events, at least... I think it is. Next lesson. Um, and this came up in one of the questions, but, but it certainly uh, is worth restating. Open media plays a key role. A key role. In fact, we can't work without it. And it's not just about saving money uh, in licenses and things like that. And, you know, sometimes people will say, well, you have to consider the total cost of ownership, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah, okay. Um, but more than that, and, and I, I'm not, I don't mean to dismiss that aspect at, at all. For a lot of people, if they have to pay money, that means they can't access the resource. And we also learned stuff like that during the pandemic, right? Uh, people who couldn't afford computer access, people who couldn't afford computers, um, all of a sudden didn't have access to uh, learning anymore. Open media isn't just about open content. Open media is about the entire infrastructure supporting online learning. That means software, that means uh, broadband access, uh, that means the content in a sense it even means the time right uh, if it costs you money to take time out of your day to learn it's not open anymore so and those are questions we've all had to think about more during the pandemic than we did before before you know well it wasn't such a big issue uh, because you know the people who weren't getting learning they were just invisible to us anyways but when the pandemic hit, the number of people not getting learning suddenly changed and we noticed. And that became important. Why do we need open? Well, you can see on the slide, right? 
we can't learn without it. We need an alphabet. We need words. We need data. We need the stuff of learning that we can work with shape and freely exchange. Um, you know, I've, I've written before, we use open media to write the first draft of our experiences, the first draft of our lessons learned, the first draft of the practices we should follow. It needs to be cheap and disposable because it's first draft material. But if we can't do the first draft material, we can't do the learning. Steven, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Let her rip. Okay, uh, we have a question from Michelle. Can interaction or uh, presence still be effective using asynchronous formats, so using video, audio, and text options? Uh, it's a different kind of presence, right? I mean, it can still be effective for sure, um, but it's harder when you can't get a response. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, I think, you know, I mean, uh, Anderson and the rest said, you know, uh, you, you can get the same kind of teaching presence and, and cognitive presence from uh, asynchronous materials. You know, um, when I read War and Peace, it felt like an event to me uh, where somebody was communicating to me and, and where I could actually feel the person at the other end of the pen and would have been written by a pen back when it was written. And, and I felt, you know, a, a sense of loss when it finished. Um, so yeah, but it's not the same. Um, you know, the, the, the question and answer bit isn't there. Uh, you know, there's, there's not the same sort of recourse when you get stuck. And here's the proof of that. Can asynchronous content make you feel? Can it make you feel angry? Can it make you feel hopeful? Um, even make you feel afraid? And I think the answer to that is yes. I think it's pretty obviously yes. I mean, I go onto Twitter, it's not hard to feel angry. In fact, it's what it's designed to do in many cases, right? So yeah, there's presence in asynchronous material but it's not always all of the presence that we want or the sort of presence that we want. Okay, that's, I take it by that silence that there isn't another question or that Sarah's on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Both, <laughs> you're good to go. All right. Uh, looking at about 20 minutes left, um, so moving on. Um, and does that mean I'm on schedule? No, I'm not on schedule. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. So, next lesson, quality matters. First part of that lesson, quality is not guaranteed. Not even if whatever it is that you're looking at, using, interacting with, etc., comes from an authority, quality is not guaranteed. Um, this is especially the case if we include properties like truth or accuracy or completeness to our definition of quality. And I think we really should. In fact, I think those are probably the key components of quality, right? good graphics are nice, getting the facts right, more important. Uh, so quality is not guaranteed. Um, but what that means is we have to make our own judgments, no matter where the information comes from. You know, when we moved, you know, I, we, we were experiencing this before, but when everything moved online, you know, the questions of, of misinformation, fake news, etc., really kind of came to the fore. Yes, they were problems before, but they really became problems during the pandemic. And they're still problems now. We not only need to learn to make our own judgments, uh, we, 
well, we know not only need to make our own judgments, we need to learn to make our own judgments and get used to making our own judgments. It's easy to just rely on an authority, um, but it's wrong to do so. Making our own judgments means, uh, you know, if you go back to the newsroom, what, what do journalists say, right? Just because somebody is an authority doesn't mean they just take them at their word. Uh, the, the old rule of journalism is always verify your information. Get it from two sources, right? Online, it might be get it from five sources. You know, get it from multiple sources and diverse sources, not different spokespeople from the same QAnon faction. That would be a bad idea, right? Diversity of sources, compare it with our own experience, make our own judgments. We all have to be critically minded and that's true of online learning as well the way to learn online is to be critically minded to not you know and it feels like a distinction from in-class learning although I don't think it should be I think you know when I was teaching philosophy one of the first things I would say to my students is don't believe everything I say I will lie to you I won't tell you when I'm lying to you it's up to you to figure that out and if people had that attitude going into classes, I think, you know, it, it would result in more interesting classes. And I asked and expected people to challenge what I said in my classes. I still expect that. That's why I want to hear your comments and your feedback. Don't just take what I have to say for granted. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, I come from a very specific perspective, very specific background and point of view. I speak based on my own experience. A lot of what I say isn't going to necessarily reflect your lived experience. Nor could it, because I'm human, I have necessarily a narrow perspective. I try to make that as diverse as I can, but you as the listener, as the viewer, still have to make those judgments. That's a lesson I think, I hope, we've learned from the pandemic, although maybe not. I don't know. David, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. From Mena. Um, do you have any suggestions or tips on facilitating engaging and effective online discussion? Some online students may think that online discussion is tedious. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, and I should really practice my suggestions more. It's just time. Uh, so, online discussions, in my opinion, are best as conversations. And yet, too often, we present them as questions and answers. Uh, somebody has a question, somebody answers the question. Um, if you look at good TV shows, uh, you know, TV shows that attract thousands, hundreds of thousands of viewers, the interviewer and the person being interviewed, it isn't just a series of questions. Now, the questions are a part of it, right? And usually you'll start off with a question. But what happens is the interviewer begins maybe with a question, maybe with an observation, the other person responds, and then the interviewer builds on that response, follows on that response. Same with you know the, these interactive questions that we're having in this session, right? Now it's kind of an awkward format, right? Because you know it's me and Sarah, and then the thousands of you, or however many there are. So it's a little bit harder. But if we brought people in, and I've seen other online sessions where they bring people in. Instead of just question and answer, question and answer, uh, having a conversation is much more interesting viewing. Discussing something, arguing about something. People love arguments. That's why CNN is so popular. You can have arguments without it descending into the ridiculousness that CNN is or, you know, the, the, the fake formality of these um, you know, Oxford debate kind of things that they do. You can have an argument online. Good TV has disagreements and differences of opinion. And that's the sort of thing that I think works. And 
you know, in an online class, especially if you have a smaller number of people, um, and especially if you've built an environment where people feel comfortable doing this, bringing in members of the class to have that kind of conversation, agreements, disagreements, working through problems, trying to find explanations, etc. That kind of viewing really is interesting viewing. Um, I've been doing a series recently called Stephen Follows Instructions. It's, it's a silly idea and nobody wanted I did a poll. Nobody voted for it. So of course I had to do it. Um, but the idea was that I uh, go to a site on the internet that gives me instructions on how to do some kind of programming task. I follow the instructions. These instructions are very often badly written. And that's the fun of the show, right? Because invariably, if I just follow the instructions, I'm going to run into a problem. Guarantee. Happens every time. And then the fun starts as I try to fall, as I try to work my way through and solve the problem. Now that would be even more fun with more than one person, I think. And you know, so you have problem, problem, person, person, interesting viewing. Um, so I think that's how I would approach it. I, I know that that's how I would approach it. And you know, there there are tons of people out there right now doing. Um, online video shows and Brian Alexander for example and, and many others and it's always this stilted question answer oh thank you that was such a great answer question answer oh thank you that was such a great answer you know, I'm falling asleep right engage have the people engage with each other maybe some argument maybe some discovery whatever that's how I would answer that question and maybe I'll do that you know, I, mean, I have in the back of my mind that I might do that and try to demonstrate it. In Canada, we had a guy called Peter Zosky, and I used to listen to him and follow the way he did his interviews. Now, I really hated his voice, <laughs> but I loved the way he set up and, and ran his interviews. They were, they were brilliant, and they would, you know, allow he would allow the person to lead them through this interesting maze of discussion and discoveries riveting listening maybe i'll do that if i ever get the time hey i have a question from ken and then i'll let you go because i know you still have a few uh oh yeah tons items of slides. to get through <laughs> Um, Ken asks, there has been much recently written about surveillance technology, especially when it comes to online remote proctoring of exams. What are your thoughts on this issue? Yeah, and, and uh, there, I have a slide later on where I talk about assessment and the, the whole question of surveillance comes up. I mean, I mean it's a bad plan, right? Uh, it's a bad plan in so many ways. Um, you know, surveillance as a means of enforcing authority, surveillance as a means of gathering information that may be used to help you, but may just as easily be used to harm you. And, and you know, you know, I would I sometimes say, you know, uh, you shouldn't care if you're being surveilled. What really matters is how they use the information. But the thing is, I can say that because they you know, rarely use the information in a bad way against me because you know, uh, I'm one of the most privileged people in society. Of course, they're not going to use it. And I work for the government. So, you know, it's just not an issue, right? But for many people, it is an issue. Uh, for many people, the mere fact that they're being surveilled uh, is a form of oppression is a, a, a way of taking away their freedom, taking away their rights, because they know that they're in a demographic uh, that is more likely to be retaliated against if they don't say the right thing, if they don't do the right thing, uh, if they don't show the proper respect for authority. So surveillance is a bad idea. Uh, I think so and so surveillance in the assistance of assessment is a bad idea 
uh, raises the question, well, what about cheating? Well, the whole concept of cheating is a bad idea in the sense that um, we've set things up in such a way that uh, the assessment can be conducted such that the student can be dishonest. I know that was a really convoluted sentence and I'm sorry for it, but um, you know, it's like, imagine we structured sports that way, where you could cheat and get away with it and win the game, unless you were caught, right? People wouldn't, you know, people really don't like that. Um, and what they don't like is not simply the cheating, but the possibility that this could work, that it's been set up in that way. Um, so that I think the answer is something like uh, we need to get away from surveillance-based, but also assessment-based kinds of, you know, like test-based, assignment-based kinds of assessment strategies. And the, the slide that I have later that I may or may not get to says that we need to be looking at alternative forms of assessment, um, assessment based on, first of all, an individual's voluntary disclosures at their own time and in their own way, um, and secondly, uh, these disclosures being used not against specific set criteria as, as you would have in an exam question, but open-ended so that they can be looked at and evaluated in different ways by different people depending on what the intent of the production of the content was and what the intent of the person looking at it was. The classic example is an online portfolio, not the static kind of graded e-portfolios that we've seen in learning management systems, but an online portfolio like, say, my website or someone else's website or the domain of one's own that Jim Groom is doing, where people put their own presence online and project that into other social networks, social media, uh, open source software, game design, TikTok videos, etc. All the different ways people can be creative. And these, this combined creative output can be used as a means of assessing a person by different people for different purposes. First of all, because it's going to be anyways. Um, and secondly, it's probably more honest to do it that way in that more open-ended way. Skip the whole thing about tests and grades and all of that and just go straight from uh, production of work to job offer. You know, everything else in between is a proxy for those things or, you know, output of work and, and whatever good things might come from it, Patreon support, uh, you know. Um, everything else is a proxy for it because in the past, we weren't able to share our work directly. Now we can. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the key thing. Turn off the surveillance, make sharing voluntary, use the sharing to do very wide and open-ended assessments. That's my whole slide later on, so when I get to that slide, I'll just skip it. So I'm gonna move to the next slide, because I got four minutes left. Uh, okay, uh, we, we've touched on this already, right? Teachers, teaching's more than broadcast. It's more than what I'm doing right now, <laughs> much more. So how do we respond to that? Um, you know, the, the typical response is, well, just give them different broadcasts, which is not it. Um, I like to tell people that one of the great things about online learning is that it gets us out of the classroom. Um, and now that we've all switched to remote learning, the best thing about online learning is it can get us away from the computer. And, you know, I mean, a big part of learning is the actual practice and doing thing. And 
we all know this. I'm not give, giving away a big, big secret here. So if we structure our online learning so that we can get people away from the computer, away from the keyboard, out and doing things, um, that's going to be a big part of learning. Now, what we can do is, is you know, well, during the pandemic, it's a bit limited, obviously. Uh, after the pandemic, though, when all, everybody returns to the classroom, and they will return to the classroom, people are going to realize, hey, wait a sec, sitting in eight hours in a classroom is boring, too. It's just I was able to complain about it when it was on Zoom. Now I'm going to complain about it when I'm in a classroom. And so we, we should be thinking about how can we get people out of the classroom? How can we get people into the community working on projects, doing things, even in class time? You know, get them out of the classroom. And, and I think, you know, and now that we're seeing in the pandemic so clearly that teaching is more than broadcasting, I, I think that we're seeing that teaching is more than broadcasting, whether online or in person. Uh, the reading the room thing, another lesson. Um, as I said earlier, online, it's a lot more difficult. It's something that we need to practice. It's something that we need deliberately to practice. This came up with the question uh, where people are asking, well, what about when you turn off your camera, right? Well, when they turn off the camera, you don't know what they're doing. Even when the camera's on, you don't know what they're doing. So you need to be looking at ways to find out how they're responding, how they're reacting. Here, I have Sarah for that. Thank you, Sarah. My pleasure, Stephen. <laughs> uh, another thing we learned during the pandemic, I think, is we need structure, order, and routines. And I could do a whole talk on that. Um, you know, I live in a world of change. Change literally is my business. But my day-to-day -day life is incredibly structured, ridiculous. I, I eat the same food for supper every day, so much so that when I eat something different, as I did yesterday, I take a picture of it and share it. Now, I might be maybe overly structured, um, although Andrea might say, every day with you is Chaos Tuesday, um, which is also true. But that's what the structure is needed for. When everything is uncertain, when everything is fluid, you need these touch points. And I think people are learning that. People are learning we need to balance work and learning. Uh, in my case, I blend them, uh, work, learning, and play. Um, but still, during the pandemic, I got into the habit of every day getting up, going out for a walk, taking some photos or whatever. School typically provided that structure. It provided a lot of things that went missing during the pandemic. And we need to think about, you know, we, we think about schools as just the place where people learn. But in fact, that might be the least important thing that a school does. Uh, it might be that the school provides the stability, the support, the predictability that people, and especially people at risk, need. Um, uh, you know, not just during the pandemic, but all of the time. It's 12 o'clock, <laughs> and I did not make it through my, uh, I didn't even make it through my lessons, uh, let alone my recommendations. Um, but I'm going to make these slides available online and you can look at the rest of these slides um, and, and substitute your own commentary. But I am going to end this session on time because uh, it's part of a larger thing and I really should be ending this on time. Sarah? Well, thank you, Stephen. This was great. You can't see it, but there has been some wonderful dialogue going in on the side as well. So thank you for everyone contributing to that as well. Your comments and suggestions and expertise have been uh, well received and, and really greatly appreciated. So a big thank you to you, Stephen, for sharing your insights and knowledge about how to improve how we teach and learn online. Um, we've had a lot of great take-home lessons to uh, put into practice. 
And I wanted to share with you a, a comment that one of our attendees posted earlier. Um, Angela mentioned that she loved the authenticity of this webinar, especially from the presenter um, perspective. Um, she mentioned that, you know, to give ourselves grace that we're all doing our best and even the most seasoned people can have blips. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad teacher. So you um, portrayed this very well with your technology issues and you kept it very real, Stephen. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I will always present technology issues because I always have them. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as Stephen mentioned, I will uh, post the slides along with the recording to teachonline.ca. Uh, just look for the webinar series tab. Um, once the recording has finished processing, um, it will go in the uh, recorded section. So you have to navigate a little bit and uh, you'll be able to find it there. And I'll, I'll put that in the chat um, briefly. Um, and you'll also find a list of our upcoming webinars for uh, March and April. Lots of good stuff coming up. So check those out while you're in there. So thank you again, Stephen. Thank you again, everybody for joining us. Um, I hope you found this session um, as uh, inspiring and informational as I did. And uh, I wish everyone a, a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, take care now. <laughs>